welcome to This Week in Games 292, where we read and distill all of the weekly game industry news so you don't have to. Here's what we got going on today. Tons of closures in the industry, so we'll hit that, and a few key hires. Matthew Ball and the Metaverse 2.0 conversation that he has with the creator of Snow Pierce, Snow cr- Snow what? Pierce, Snow Pierce, or nope. is it different? That's a different Snow Crash. Snow Crash. Oh, What's Snow wrong Crash. With you? God damn it! I, well, I don't know why. Why I was thinking the, about that's the, the wrong one where they fight okay. on the trains to death. Oh, that's that's right. That's what. I, yeah. Digital toys and experiences. Lots to go on there. Monopoly Go goes meta. There's a board game that becomes a video game that becomes a board game. It's really fun. The FTC is pissed at Microsoft for raising prices on Game Pass and. Much, much more. Google, you know, goes ATT, which is a whole fun thing I'll get to. Okay, so hi, I'm Jen Donahoe, Strategic Marketing Consultant at Beta Hat and Jane Inferno. Today we have Philip Black, Game Economist at Game Economist Consulting. What up, punks? Oh, sorry, wrong character. Um, (laughs) Hey, what's up? Hey, hey. (laughs) Took my line. (laughs) Eric Ress, Principal at Gossamer Consulting Group. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Good to see your fellow method actor. <laughs> oh, it's going to be one of those days. It is just the three of us. Mishka is on vacation and Laura, unfortunately, has had um, kind of a, a challenging situation. So hopefully sending good thoughts to her and she'll be back next week. All right. So a little banter for us. We had a happy hour last week in L.A. It was really fun. So thanks to Brett Liang from Stash for basically letting us take over the event while he paid for everything was pretty awesome. So Crest came out and we hung out all day. So first off, how was the car? The electric BMW. Was it okay? Well, I, I, it's a, it's a beautiful car, <laughs> amazing tech, but it's still electric. <laughs> and she didn't let me drive it by, I think intentionally. Oh, well, I just forgot. Like, honestly, I, t- I should have. By the time I thought about it, we were in the city and, it, and you wouldn't have been able to do anything. So that was my fail. Well, yeah, it's also L.A. It's not really fun to drive in L.A. anywhere, period. So yeah. it's like uh, that is part of the problem. That is part of the problem. So at the event, uh, I was really impressed. So many great folks, people from Jam City, Netflix, Warner Brothers, Amazon Games, Scopely, a few of the PMs came up to us and a few of the marketing folks who they were so lovely and complimentary and wanted to just, you know, talk Monopoly Go and geek out. Also a super fan of us, Grace, who does M&A for Scopely was there as well. She, I always see her at these events and hi to her because she's just such a baller. I love seeing women doing like M&A stuff. It's like super cool. So Cress, thank you for coming out. Hey, it was awesome. No problem. I did I see a couple of guys from EA. One of my old guys from Kabam was there. It was a really good turnout, at least for me. I was cool for one day with my 15-year-old son for attending a 100 Thieves event. Evidently, that is a big brand in the world of teenagers. And I got my first tour of the Blizzard campus. Dude, that's checklist shit, you know? I've been subscribing for a while for fucking 20 years. I finally get to see it and do that iconic shot of the big statue in the middle of the campus, which was very cool. Oh, and then I saw one of my old buddies from Kabam there as well when we were there. But, I, you know, I have to admit, even though the Blizzard probably was the highlight, the biggest surprise was this, this fucking Google office. Holy shit. This L.A. Google office is ridiculous. Absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. It is by far the nicest office i've ever seen in my entire life it was an aircraft hangar for fucking the spruce goose which is a wooden fucking you know plane back in the day right they they completely retrofitted rebuilt this thing absolutely massive ceilings huge wide open feel to the whole thing they had like the themed conference rooms or whatever it is the most profound waste of space i've ever seen in an office like only these absolutely insanely wealthy fucking type companies could uh, put, pull this off right in this day and age. Right. But it was absolutely beautiful. And, uh, I, I've never seen anything like it. So. Yeah, no, I agree. It might be my f- most favorite campus of I've ever seen of any of the companies in our space. You just, f- you feel like you're working outside when you're inside. It was so yeah. beautiful. Yeah, exactly. It, it, okay. It, it, it's ridiculous. I want that for us as a gaming industry. Like I want our own hangar. <laughs> Like even Hangar 13 doesn't have doesn't work in a hangar. Like we we deserve that. I don't think the gaming industry will ever have the kind of money that's just 
fucking throwing out there like Google, you know. And, and, well, isn't there like Zynga money back in the day? Didn't they like they? There they was. Hosted, yeah, they There's... had like Kanye at like the Giant Stadium. I know. I always hear shit like there was an actual deer at their Christmas party. I hear some stories. I worked at the old San Francisco office, and can I just say the cafeteria was amazing. I mean, that was probably my second favorite cafeteria. Riot's cafeteria is number one, by the way. But the Zenga cafeteria, there was like an on-site butcher. Everything was prepared like from like farm to table. So the old Zynga campus was not bad, but, but 10x above this is the cool one. It's crazy. But you got some feedback, right? Like people gave us a lot of like nice kudos. It was nice to get that in person that your podcast doesn't suck, guys. And you guys aren't dumb. I, no, I enjoyed actually, hearing yeah, that. Yeah, two separate people, I think maybe three even came up to me and said kind of the same thing. It's like, thank you for what you do. It really helped me kind of prepare for my interviews and it helped me get my job type thing. And I was like, holy shit, dude, we're fucking doing God's work right now. You know what I'm saying? We got this on point, you know? Anyway, it was very good to hear. A few people said that they make our podcast mandatory listening for any new hires, especially if they come in to gaming from another industry. God, I was heaven like, help them. Oof, I know. I was like, oh, my God. What torture. We're mandatory <laughs> listening? I can't imagine a worse punishment. I know. So for all of you new folks, thank you for, <laughs> for putting up with us and our newsletter and everything. Join the Slack channel. We haven't said that in a while. So go to deconstructorofun.com. Apply to join the Slack channel, follow the newsletter, and yeah, give us a nice rating. All right, what else? Oh, I wanted to say, Philip, uh, Halo. So Halo, the TV show got canceled. If you listen to us, you know that Phil and I watched the show, and there's 100% less sex with Master Chief and anyone else now because the show is canceled. Although, was it a rumor that Christopher Nolan wanted to pick it up and do something with the series? What's going on there? I think it's going to get picked up by Netflix. I have a feeling what? that Netflix is going to pick this shit up. Yep. Really? No, yep. the budget is going to be insane. There's all this IP baggage. This is ugh, this is a toxic property. There's no upside. Oh, oh this is bad. This is <laughs> We were talking about this like last week. Like This is Microsoft's big fuck up on Game Pass is yeah. that they didn't yeah. tend Thank to their core yeah. franchises. Yeah. Thanks, Phil Spencer. Thank you. <laughs> We need to make the transmedia point. No one, no one is going back and citing Halo Infinite numbers when the Halo TV show comes out. Like, where are all those pieces? When I talked about Fallout in the context of transmedia, I posted the image of that World War II example of the planes who keep coming back and they reinforce where they get shot. Of course, they weren't looking at the planes that were downed and where they had been shot. And so, like, when you look at transmedia, you can't just look at the most prestigious example. You need to look at, okay, what's the expected outcome? What's the average outcome? What is the bulk of this evidence suggesting? So I'm just saying this is another N in that category. You got to look at these two. All right. Okay. I don't see any shills, although Gamescom is coming up. I don't know. I'm not going. Chris, you're not going. Phil, are you going to Gamescom? No. No. All right. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Mishka can't go because, yeah, he's getting called up thank you for your service mishka <laughs> for those who don't know he's in the finnish army reserves is that right. is that correct right no corrections as well we, we of course uh, not we're perfect oh, well perfect well whatever all right so quick hits really quick on ads google announced yesterday that it's no longer intends to deprecate third-party cookies in the chrome browser this is kind of like apple's att policy for the web which is basically going to pass on the responsibility of the opt-in to the consumer instead of them having to deal with it. So this just got announced. I'm sure Eric Seifert already has a ton of posts about this. This is web. This is not mobile. So if you are a web-based marketer, just kind of keep an eye on what's going on with that. So moving on to the FTC and Xbox Game Pass, the FTC called the Game Pass standard tier, a degraded product that could harm consumers. Microsoft is raising the price for Game Pass Ultimate product to $16.99 a month. From $16.99 to $19.99 a month, a 17% year-on-year increase. Additionally, Microsoft is discontinuing the $10.99 a month console Game Pass product. Users of that product must pay 
81% more to switch to Game Pass Ultimate. For, co for consumers unwilling to pay 81% more, Microsoft is introducing a degraded product, Game Pass Standard, at $14.99 a month. This product costs 36% more than the console Game Pass <laughs> and withholds day one releases. Woo! So wow. this was the FTC going back to the judge because the, the merger, I, I guess, is on appeal the merger of Microsoft and Activision Blizzard. So Lena Khan's team is kind of saying, excuse me, this kind of sucks. There's a chart that we have if you're watching just the show, the the price increases over the last few years. It's pretty crazy. Chris, yeah, what, I mean, okay. what's going on? I, I actually talked to a bunch of people about this over the last couple of weeks, and I, I want to be really crystal clear here because I think basically what's happening is that leadership of Microsoft is saying, if you don't have the letters AI in your division, you must be profitable ASAP. And the only way to get profitable at Xbox is to raise prices on this dumb subscription, right? For your faithful. And go back to like traditional, like full game downloads, like the, the PlayStation model for the rest of your looky-loos people on Xbox at this point, right? And so Microsoft's goal was get to 100 million subs, which makes sense. You scale it up and then start raising prices, but they didn't barely got to 30, you know? And so now like raising prices is complete departure from that goal. At the end of the day, Microsoft cannot lose this AI war because they lost mobile, social, search, browser, hell, even like cloud, they're kind of lost to, you know, Amazon and, and Google to a lesser degree. So basically every dollar is going towards winning the AI race. And that means that Xbox somehow has to get profitable. And of course, the subscription thing, which never made sense to begin with, is getting de-emphasized. And now they're going back to traditional. But at the end of the day, I think it's a little too late. This strategy kind of sunk them to some degree. And a lot of people that I talk to basically agree that probably after the next hardware cycle, Xbox will likely get shut down or, or spun out. But, you know, we'll see. You know, they're going to limp along right? And trying to make a play at it. They have a lot of smart people there. So maybe they can figure something out that I don't see, but it looks pretty tough. I'm waiting for the ad tier to show up. <laughs> uh, maybe, I mean, you laugh. However, everyone, that's what everyone realizes. If you do want scale, add an ad tier. I mean, that's what Netflix, okay. Netflix I, has done. That's not the type it's of scale we want though. <laughs> you yeah, know? With all due respect, they do not have the content to oh, agree. do a broad subscription, they certainly do not have the content to do an ad tier type bullshit, right? It's like, it's a completely different product and a different service and a different audience. And this is why the subscriptions never made sense to begin with, right? It's a fucking a la carte business. It's not a subscription business. It always has been, and it likely always will be, at least on the console side. Oh, that is a correction. By the way, I did misspeak oh. last, last week. Oh, okay. uh, I think there I said go. the opposite last week, but I think people understood what I meant based upon my tone, but uh, it's an a la carte business. It is not a subscription business. All right, cool. All right, so moving on from gameindustry.biz, SAG-AFTRA is ready to strike if game companies don't come to the table with a deal to protect jobs against AI, and this is for voice actors. So the board has unanimously agreed to permit its chief negotiator to call an immediate strike at will, the bargaining has been ongoing since October of 22 with, you know, all of the big players, Activision, EA, Epic, Insomniac, WB, and the members actually approved a strike nine months ago during the whole rider strike issue that was going on. So just keep an eye on that as well. There could be a voice actor strike in gaming. Cress, we are old after all. So Stephen Totillo from Gamefile, he posted that the game industry's workforce is getting older. So there he put this chart in his newsletter that I get, according to Game Files Check, of publicly available data from Ubisoft, Capcom, Nintendo, and the International Game Developers Association. You know, it's only old people who make games now. So the average age of employees at Nintendo has cracked 40 this year for the first time since the company began reporting the stat. So I just thought this was interesting of like, how do we get younger people to making games? I guess they're all off doing the six person UEFN studio or something like that. And we're not hiring them into big game companies, Nothing wrong I guess, because we're laying everybody off. So how do they get a job? I, I don't know about this data. Like he's showing that the average age of the Nintendo employee is increasing. Sure. But this just follows like demographic trends in Japan that the populace is aging. 
So he doesn't really control for that. So you don't know if this is like a Nintendo effect or game industry effect or Japanese effect. Like I would take this with a grain of salt sometimes. All right, my data nerd, I should have consulted with you before I put it in there. <laughs> yeah, because cause, cause, Fair cause point. Mobile, mobile would likely skew this down quite a bit. You know? All three people working in the Nintendo mobile department? <laughs> no, no, if it wasn't Nintendo, no, no. sorry. <laughs> I was arguing your point. If it wasn't Nintendo. <laughs> I know. If it was if it was a more broad based yep. sorry, right. shut the fuck up. No, no. He he cites Ubisoft, Capcom, Nintendo, right? So uh, you're right, it isn't a broad kind of cross section of the industry. Mainly I just wanted to make an old joke because of us. Okay, let's move on to investments in MA. Absolutely. So US based video game commerce company Exola friends over at Exola, has acquired UK-based social gaming platform LF.group for an undisclosed price. Exola will use LF.group's technological stack to create solutions for developers and gaming communities. This is an interesting vertical. We also have news that US-based games development fund platform Dusk has raised $8 million in funding led by Makers Fund. Ooh, interesting. Do we, do we know more about this? You know, maybe we can get someone from Makers to talk about this. Very interesting. Mm. The funds will support the development of the company's platform, which allows developers to build social games. Interesting. So maybe another UGC play. This one was surprising. Warner Brothers Games has acquired the multiverses developer Player First Games. I was surprised. Usually you want to see uptick in the product and then you acquire the studio. This is another acquire. This is like... But why do you want to buy this asset that just went down... (laughs) You know, that wasn't, it wasn't a good I'm, launch. I'm assuming they're <laughs> building like, right? building something else for them at this point, but I don't know. Yeah, you would have to imagine there's a longer term play here than just that game. Interesting. Okay. Sweden-based PC and console games developer Blue Scarab Entertainment has raised $7 million in seed round funding led by NetEase. Wow, they are really getting out in the West and making a ton of investments. I keep hearing about a lot of these NetEase studios, which have been started or at least backed. The funds will be used to develop their debut MMO RPG title. It's back, the studio is backed by a bunch of genre veterans, and the CTO and CEO of the company were responsible for Anarchy Online, along with the rest of the team who are responsible for other projects such as Helldivers 2, which is by Arrowhead. It's actually out here in Sweden, and some ex-Blizzard team members. All right. All right, Chris, there's a lot going on with closures and new hires. What do you got? Yeah. Well, first, NetherRealm confirms it's shutting down Mortal Kombat Onslaught, which is their mobile game, and basically removing that group. Just pulled up, because I was like, oh, Mortal Kombat on on mobile seems like that's a good idea. 4 million downloads and 2.2 million revenue. There's another game. A little less than a year. There there was another game that was Mortal Kombat on mobile that did much better. That died yeah. out. I, I I can't forget the name of it, Eric. I'm, a little bit, I'm a, again too close to this one. I can't really comment on it, so I'll okay. keep going. Forte shuts down its mobile developer Rumble Entertainment. That was again part of the other team that was shut down last week, right? So is this the blockchain developer, the blockchain company that yeah, raised like a bajillion yeah. dollars and then was never heard from again? Again, can't he can't? <laughs> oh, okay. There, there's so yeah, many yeah. few things I can't comment on, right. and that's okay. these right. are right. two right. of them. Yeah, one, yeah. two. Perfect World CEO and co-CEO resign after mass layoffs. Yeah, there was a huge layoff at Perfect World in the U.S., I think. And so I guess these guys got got dumped. Blizzard's John Height and former Bungie COO Holly Barbakovi. Barbakovi? Uh, they are joining Hasbro, part of a huge restructuring of the org. Keep in mind that Owen Mahoney and Frank Chabot joined the board a few months ago. It seems that they are attracting you know, big names to fill out the uh, leadership team at Hasbro. There was some rumors that the CEO was going to get removed, but replaced by maybe Owen or Frank, maybe not. I don't know. Yeah, I saw that the CEO, Chris Cox, had just in May signed a a renewed, a three-year contract extension. So I don't know enough about employment law in Rhode Island, but that seems difficult to know where they're going. I, I do know that they are publicly out there saying that they are a digital game company, which was ironic because under Brian Goldner, who sadly passed away a few years ago, Hasbro used to go out and say, we're a content company. They used to compete with Hollywood, you know, with all of the Transformers movies and everything that they were doing in Hollywood. So it's no longer the message. They've gone back to Hollywood and said, never mind, actually, we're a digital game company. We've got, you know, all of the Watsy products. We've got Monopoly Go. 
But isn't this the play, though? If they're hiring all these people, isn't this the play to own the means of production now? All these guarantees from all these other companies. So Hasbro right now, market cap around eight, eight, nine billion. Scopely sold the savvy for 4.9 billion. Hasbro is the house that built Scopely in many ways, right? And it wasn't just Monopoly Go. I mean, the Dice franchise was huge. That was a profit center for Scopely for a very long time. And by the way, no one's talked about that. I think it's done, what, 500 million in lifetime revenue, more than 500 million. I don't know what the last press release was. But those have Yahtzee been enormously with successful. Buddies? Yahtzee with buddies. Like, and Scrabble. <laughs> you know, there's, there's a lot of licensed IP out here. Why not take a chunk of that for yourself? Boulder's Gate. I mean, it's not just on the yes. mobile side. That's that's Dungeons and Dragons. Yes. Why are we just getting these flat rate checks? Like, I want to okay. share. I want upside. Are we really going to rehash this shit again? <laughs> like, I mean, how many times do these companies need to fail before people realize that it's not a viable option? Having said that, to your point, they are basically hiring the bench to potentially manage teams and build product, right? And they do have a group of developers in-house that could yes. develop games in theory, but so far, they've done fuck and all, right? With the exception of the Magic the Gathering game, which I yeah. think is part of their team. But They're doing both. And so I think this is a smart strategy, which is they do have some studios. And some of those studios do mobile. And some of them are doing HD products that are in the works. And then they also license. And again, I think you got, everyone knows, I've talked about this 100 times. I love the licensing model when you've got great IP. So I think they're going to take some big swings on developing games themselves and then they're going to continue with the licensing model and they built the team to do both of those things which is incredibly smart and that way you don't have to go through what when you have a publicly traded company and your game slips like that kind of fucks you and so they're gonna you know reduce their risk by doing licensing and internal development as their strategy i, I want to be crystal clear as far as i understand it and i i looked at this company really closely like maybe six months ago they do not have the internal capability of building Monopoly Go. They just don't. Oh, they just no. don't have Agreed. a team like Scopely in-house that could actually build a game like that. No matter how much they want it to happen, they don't have that, right? And if that's not hard, <laughs> hard enough, they certainly don't have the ability to build a Baldur's Gate game. <laughs> like, absolutely not, right? Like, that is a completely, you know, huge team with like deep experience of AAA development, right? They do not have those type of teams at Hasbro. They have a team in North Carolina. I don't know enough about them. I looked into it and no. Okay. Okay. I don't know that background. I agree with you that if you want to be a top 10 leader in mobile, you know, they should just continue to license their brands to experts in that space. If they want to compete at the Baldur's Gate level, they have a lot of work to do to staff up the internal teams to be able to compete at that level. Otherwise, they're going to have double A games with their brands. And again, I want to reiterate, the fact is that before they were a toy company with a digital business. Now they are a digital company with a toy business. Like that is how they're positioning themselves full Correct. stop. And so all Correct. this movement is for that. All right. The next one, Netflix taps Epic Games' Elaine Taskin. As president of games, he was part of the, he was like, I think he was like the a part of the development team for Epic where he kind of all oversaw the first party game development of both Fortnite, Lego Fortnite, Rocket League, Fall Guys, etc. In this new role, Taskin will report directly to co-CEO Greg Peters. Thank the fucking gods. It was not a tech bro or some McKenzie douche, right? They actually here. hired a gaming person. That's good news. <laughs> good, good news for all my friends that work at Netflix, your $600,000 salaries are fucking secure. Don't worry about it. At least for the next couple of years, man. You guys are good. You guys are good. I'm glad. And for once, I'm glad I was wrong about something. This is all good. You, you know, don't worry. Keep buying houses and paying for these fancy cars. Dude, your salary is, is safe. All right. Generally speaking. So I think that's really good news. No, everybody, anybody else have comments? No. I, listen, they, they elevated the position. So Verdue was a VP and now the position is a president level reports to the co-CEO. I think this is a signal like, Hey, everybody, actually, we are serious about this. I hope we, we start to hear a strategy and we yeah. start to <laughs> really understand what that means. You know, the signal is we're serious. So tell us how you're serious instead of the Hey, we had some GTA downloads and we have 80 games in development. Let's hear some real strategy. There's been, a, you know, three years of throwing spaghetti at the wall. 
let's get serious. I can't wait. And I, I hope they reach out to Mishka and I hope they come to us when Elaine is ready to do his first kind of tour and talk about what he wants to do. I will say, as a side note, completely unrelated to some degree, is that, you know, the EA exec BMI thing seems to be still in effect, right? All these leadership changes have some glaring, glaring similarities, right? So Chris Cox definitely hits that mark, you know, of that sub 25, 20 BMI that you need to be an executive in the business. John Height definitely getting there. He may need some work. And Elaine Taskin, for certain, right? Owen Mahoney, Frank Jabot, like all these guys have that EA, BMI. So public service announcement to anybody that wants to be at exec levels at these publicly traded companies, you know, put down the donuts and get on the treadmill because you got to be sub 20, you know, to get to even get like even consider these type of roles these days. So I'm glad EA has made its stamp on the business of uh, video games and exec level performance. Um Anyway, yeah, I'm sorry. Just this public service. A little, little fitness call out. Okay, got it. <laughs> Deconstructor Fun is brought to you by Sensor Tower. Sensor Tower recently acquired mobile analytics company Data AI, formerly known as App Annie. Navigate the mobile app market with precision using Sensor Tower, the ultimate tool for app intelligence. Uncover competitive insights and trends that shape the top ranking apps across global marketplaces. With Sensor Tower, elevate your app strategy by tracking key performance metrics, optimizing keyword selections, and analyzing market data effectively. Harness the power to anticipate changes and adapt swiftly, ensuring your app not only competes, but leads. Sensor Tower, where data meets strategy, propelling your app to new heights. You've heard of Heroic Labs by now, and we keep talking about them because in today's mature market, you need every edge to be successful. Rather than spending those precious company dollars on building game tech, focus on building your game and shipping it. Get into your players' hands faster and grow your community. Heroic Labs is battle-tested partner and friend of the podcast. Their tech enables you to be flexible, creative, and scale for success. Heroic Labs has your tech stack covered. Whether you're looking for a world-class backend game server, an amazing game development framework, fantastic live ops tooling, or reliable mass scalability, Heroic Labs has solutions for all of these challenges. And it's not just us at Deconstructor of Fun praising Heroic Labs. The company works with some of the world's biggest publishers on many of the beloved games. Focus on your game, save a big chunk of cheese, and avoid tech risks with Heroic Labs. All right, let's get into games. Phil. Honor of Kings has been downloaded 13 million times outside of China since its worldwide global launch on June 20th, and it's generated 5 million in revenue. <laughs> Eric, do you want to do the line or should I? <laughs> no, I'll do it. I'll do it. There, okay, there was okay, a press good. release that they said that they did 50 million downloads, so I just want to be clear okay. on that, right? Outside of China, which I, which obviously did not translate well to the sensor tower data for some reason. I don't know why, but the regardless, they've only done 5 million in fucking revenue. Can we please just stop making MOBAs for the West? Just stop. Just everyone just stop again. I, I, I don't know how many times I'm going to say this. Just stop. Done. All right, yeah. I mean, I have talked about this at nauseum. I think people know I, I worked on uh, wild rift league of legends, wild rift. I, was at Riot when we launched mobile games and know a lot about Honor of Kings in China. In China, it is it is incredibly massive. And I think the challenge is when Wild Rift wasn't as successful in the West, Tencent was like, okay, well, fuck you guys. We think we can do it better. And clearly, it's still the the fact, as Chris says, that MOBAs don't work outside of China. That's not how the, the, the story that I have been told is that Riot didn't want to put League on mobile they were, because yeah, they didn't they want to degrade the experience and so tencent said all right do whatever you want we're making this i didn't go as far back in time okay. yes so way back in the way back machine tencent went to riot and said please put league on mobile for china and riot said no so honor of kings was developed as a china only skew and that was immensely successful in china then riot was like oh shit mobile's a thing we should make wild rift so then they made wild rift and wild rift was designed to go not only in China, which it doesn't suck in China, and then go out to the entire market, 
where it didn't necessarily work in the West. Then, with that not working as well, Tencent said, well, fuck you guys, we're going to take Honor of Kings global, which is what they have done, and now we all know that MOBAs don't work in the West. So that's, that's the full like thread of the story of why Honor of Kings even launched outside where it was going to compete with Wild Rift. Does that make sense? I just, I still don't really understand how Arena Valor fits into this, which was the rebrand of this, which was launched in the West. Correct. That was launched first before Wild Rift. And, and I mean, as someone working on it, I was like, oh God, I mean, just stop. you know, yeah, right. just stop. Yeah. Just stop. Yeah. Speaking of starting, College Football 25 is back and it has topped PlayStation's bestseller list days after its release. So I guess it's outselling Madden then. 2.21 million copies of the $100 premium edition have sold. Love it. And this is the first time college athletes have been paid for their likeness to appear in game with EA offering 600 to over 11,000 players, $600. That's not a lot, actually. That's like a couple no. textbooks. <laughs> Ubisoft today put out its earnings report for the first quarter of the fiscal year 2025. And they are up. They were a report that is because of high level of engagement from X Defiant. Fuck yeah. 10 million players in the first two weeks. Uh, X going to give it to you. Similarly, they noted the success of Rainbow Six's Siege's Marketplace, which blew my mind. I didn't know they had done this. I don't know if you guys had seen this, but they launched a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace. Very similar what? to Steam's Marketplace for Rainbow Six Siege items. I logged into it today. No I had no idea this was out. This is incredible news i think this you know this could be driven by the web3 team they have in there now i don't think they're using web3 tech but i assume that group influenced this but you can trade items that are cosmetic based on that marketplace and ubisoft will take 10 percent cut of the transaction fee so this is what a lot of web3 companies hmm. are trying to do is to live off transaction fees and it's very difficult to do so if you want just like 10 million in monthly revenue you need to do 100 million in market value at a 10 percent right transaction mm -hmm. fee and so you just run this math and you're like there are very few games that can pull this off but nonetheless mm -hmm. it's super interesting to see this be developed they also attributed year nine season one revenue as being the highest on record as well so it's not just the marketplace there was looks like some core things that happened in the game but i'm curious to see if they will roll this out to other games if they'll scale this tech at all if this backs into web3 strategy but i was really surprised to hear about this i just went under my radar hmm. very tough to pull this off doesn't it mess with your economy? It does huge things to your economy. Like yeah. a, huge implications. Okay. You, you need a team Let's to manage this. I mean, you're competing with people that, you know, already, ha already have the, you know, the asset yourself. You know, you struggle around price discrimination. So you can't offer one country less and one country more in terms of hard currency. Because then the people will VPN and buy the cheap one and export it to the, to, you know, the high price country. Like there's a bunch of implications when you get into peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces. You get pay to earn economics if you can earn these items for free. So now you might have a spike of people in India or the Philippines mm -hmm. logging in. Like there's just a ton of consequences that come with the marketplace. And there is one more marketplace I wanted to cover, and it is a Web3 game that is finally launching their three metaverse titles. They're called Luvium. They raised a billion dollars. Oh boy, or they had a market cap of a billion dollars, and they've taken okay. various forms of funding. Usually it's been token sales, and they're one of the, I, say, I would argue, key projects to look at in terms of you know, how Web3 is being developed and whether or not they're making progress. And one of the things they do in their token is they actually give you dividends, which is super illegal, and I've always been curious how they pull this off. But they're launching three of their Web3 games that are based on a common set of assets. So when we talk about interoperability, and we talk a lot about these Web3 features, they're at least building some part of it. And, and let's see how the games are. Let's see what the quality is. I think one of them is like an auto chess game. They have an MMO one, and then they have like a meta collection game as well. It's funny, in the beginning of that intro, you said metaverse. I think you meant Web3. It was pretty funny. Oh, I, I think the metaverse, <laughs> the metaverse stuff gets thrown on quite a bit in Web3, too. <laughs> Oh, interesting. More news. Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3 is finally coming to Game Pass on July 24th. You were just mentioning this part of the some of the FTC shenanigans is interesting. Is we're, we're finally seeing a lot of the acquisition titles come to Game Pass. I don't know if this will do anything to MAU. Probably not. Hmm. No. No? Not. You, you think there's going to be zero impact, <laughs> Eric? None. None. <sighs> oh, interesting. All right. We should place a bet. I mean, I think we're all going to bet the same way, so it's not really Sorry, a bet. I, but I, 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 you can't say zero. It's going to have impact, but short term and not sustainable and yeah, not agree. interesting. And one last piece of news: Monopoly Go goes full circle as Scopely and Hasbro are launching a new Monopoly Go board game based on the board Monopoly game Go. based on 
<laughs> based on all I, I mean, this is this great. is brilliant. Yeah, love it. As I said on LinkedIn, you know, a board game based upon a game based upon a board game. It's very meta and very strange. Oh no, it's brilliant. I mean, absolutely brilliant. So one of the things as an IP holder, when you have a licensee who creates a version of your brand whether it be art or characters or gameplay, the licensor owns that. And so they are able to take that iteration and do whatever the fuck they want with it. So Scopely is probably not going to get anything out of the revenue of that board game sale. They will, however, get the halo effect. Get that board game bump. (laughs) Exactly. But what's interesting in the world of licensing, though, is if you are the person who really helps to grow the license sometimes you may not be able to capitalize on that when the license war goes and does other things with it. So a little interesting licensing fact for you. So what else we got? First Descendant? Only one other market update. I'm continuing to track the First Descendant. In terms of PSU, it's been, you know, on a downward decline, as you would expect, but usually for HD games that that kind of have this large spike, there's a quick descent, but this has decayed, I would argue, at a slower rate. Let's see where it steadies out. They peaked at around 250,000 CCU, and they're down to about 150. But it's largely maintained when you look at it compared to other releases we looked at against the finals and multiverses. I'm very curious to see how this one will perform in, let's say, three or six months from now. And when you look at the player distribution, a lot of the times this is estimated from reviews. I'm not quite sure how Video Game Insights is doing it. The player mix from different regions is pretty healthy. Around 50% of the players are from Europe or North America, and I expected to see more of a Chinese presence here. But this is a pretty healthy mix, I would argue, for the long term of this game. It's a pretty diverse global audience. (laughs) All right, that's all I got. All right, so here we're going to go into deeper into some topics. Professor Kress has a whole evaluation on Matthew Ball's latest interview. But Phil, why don't you like tell us a little bit about what that interview was about, what the content was before we... We get the Cress professor oh, standing up and yelling at him. It's happening. Yeah, topics. So Matthew Ball is coming out with a new version of his Metaverse book. And as part of the press tour, he got Tim Sweeney, of course, who's the founder and CEO of Epic Games, to uh, do an interview, as well as Neil Stevenson, who is the best-selling author and coined the term Metaverse from the bestseller book that he crafted called Snow Crash. <laughs> now, now, I didn't know this. He's a co-founder of a blockchain startup and an AI storytelling platform called when, when Air. So he, he had something to sell on this podcast. And so there's, there's no audio, unfortunately. So this is all in text. It's been, it's been transcribed and edited by Matthew Ball. And I think there's some very interesting quotes. And I think the first one has always been, what is the definition of a metaverse? And so Ball will get to this in his book, and he does it by chapter three. And so just to clarify what he t- when he talks about a metaverse, Matthew Ball, when he defines it, it is a massively scaled and interoperable network of real-time rendered 3D virtual worlds and environments which can be experienced synchronously and persistently by an effectively unlimited number of users with an individual sense of presence and with the continuity of data such as identity, history, entitlements, objects, communications, and payments. And I think to Tim Sweeney, by the way, is a brilliant individual. In this interview, he says things that you know have stuck with me already. He says the word metaverse is like a stock price and that, you know, sometimes when something good comes out, the price goes up. When (laughs) something bad comes out, the price goes down. But Tim Sweeney also mentions that when he's referring to a metaverse, he's talking about users going into a real-time 3D environment with their friends. They're engaging in a variety of different experiences. Well, I think that the point, too, that, that Tim Sweeney is making is it doesn't have to be a VR world. And that, that's why he considers Fortnite and actually Roblox and Minecraft and some others as metaverse experiences is that, you know, when you when you think back to the the OG game of Doom, like that was the first kind of you felt like you're moving through a, a, a 3D world, even though you're on a 2D screen with a mouse and keyboard. And so I think that's where a lot of the where a lot of people kind of misconstrue their vision of the metaverse is that it had to be a thing where you strap a vr headset on well he he dunks on this and he's he's a fun ceo to watch and and to listen to he says well i think that particular version when he's referring to facebook and meta's version of the metaverse with people putting on vr headsets and going to the office and working with their coworkers and their silicon valley chick art style that was just totally lame and that was never going to succeed wow love it tim (laughs) Well, he's right. I mean, he is right. 
how, anyone would have been able to know that. Like that was, you know, this is why consumer insights is a thing. And I know not everyone is like, you can't research everything, but just ask people, you know, how they react to some of these experiences. Do you want to go every day and put a headset on and talk to, you know, people with no legs in a, in a virtual environment? Fuck no. Like we're already talking to people on Zoom. Like why would that even have the, what would be better about that? So I think as tech people, we sometimes forget that what what do humans, how do humans behave and what is interesting to them in, in terms of, does it make it better for me to do that? No. And versus can the tech do that? And is that magical? And I think that's what happened to Meta is that they got sucked into the the vision and the tech versus the, does somebody want to do this? Yeah, I, but I think Matthew Ball was the part of the reason that people started going down this absurd direction, you know, like he got so caught up in the fervor of this nonsense that he put out this book that was completely obscene, absurd, that the, the things that would never happen in, in, in a million years, you know? And so like, anyway, I think he was part of the zeitgeist that got this metaverse term to mean something that it never was meant to mean, you know? So anyway. But what I, I don't understand about, Ball's writing sometimes is whether or not he's arguing that the metaverse is like a prediction that he think is going to come true or whether or not it's something he wants to come true. I'm, I'm never quite sure what this term is supposed to mean. Like does Matthew oh, Ball, I see. Yeah. like it's very hard for me to understand what he's trying to argue here, which is, which is why I feel like this conversation always becomes gobbledygook and people end up saying, well, I mean, is it Roblox? I mean, why isn't Roblox fit this exact definition? That's always really confused me. But I would say, like, he has falsifiable elements in his theory. Like, the thing that I keep going back to, and I think you might agree with this, Eric, is that they keep talking about this 3D aspect as being part of the metaverse. That it's an interconnected 3D world, and that's a really shitty UX to interface with so many different parts of the world. Like, sometimes menus are easier, or sometimes using chat is easier. And so if that's the case, you can, I mean, the internet is the metaverse. Like I log into discord, I log into steam. And so at that point, oh, you, you log know, into it, Facebook, you log it, into it's Instagram. Just, yeah. That, it's, it's, it's gobbledygook. Yeah. Like this, this means nothing. And if you think it's a 3d world, that's a really shitty user input. And that's why I, I would argue a lot why VR stuff hasn't taken off. I want menus, <laughs> give me menus. I want forks, you know, like give me real utensils. That's why I think Tim Sweeney argues that the 3d immersive world is Fortnite, where you've got menu screens on a 2d screen. But, you know, we, we are faking the 3D experience because we've been able to do that through what you feel on 2D. So I, I would think Tim is actually arguing that Fortnite is a metaverse. I call them mini metaverses because the other thing that they talk about, that Matthew Ball talks about, is that there's one. You know, it's like the one metaverse yeah. to rue them all where everyone's in this one decentralized experience and, and just the way that capitalism works and the way that our economy works is that just is never going to happen. You, the internet is not a utility. It's not one thing. And everyone right. is creating their bespoke walled gardens. And so it's just the economics aren't going to be there or the incentives aren't going to be there. And this was my criticism like two years ago when the first book came out, right? Is that I think he got the basics right. He got, you know, user generated content, immersive experiences, social interaction, cross platform accessibility. Mm -hmm. Those were like table stakes back in 2022, you know, like that, that's, that was already happening. Right. But what he got wrong was all the expectations around it. You know, this ubiquitous metaverse of shared standards across multiple vendors. Like it's, it, it was absurd, you know, persistent virtual worlds, like connected worlds between multiple different vendors, interoperability, you know, where assets and identities are going across different platforms. I mean, no, like that's not happening. Decentralization. Hold up, hold up, hold up. There is a grain of truth here. Like we have seen crossplay exist. Like that is something becoming closer. Like I can play as an Xbox user on Fortnite with my friend who is in PlayStation. My identity does not go across, but they kind of have a super account. But th th there, there's something there. I agree with you. It's, I don't think it's what he's referring to. No, it's really not. Well, it's like taking your Fortnite gun into Halo, right? Like so. Yeah. Yes, and you're right. Interoperability in terms of cross-platform play has been kind of the next level, the cool thing. And persistent world, by the way, is they make a joke actually in in the interview. They call it a it, it, you know we would call this a safe state. Like you can save your fucking game. Like that's pretty you know obvious. Which ironically, Fortnite didn't have for the longest time. Fortnite Creative, like that was a big issue. Oh, right. okay. No, fair point. And and that's why they you know they're they're constantly progressing. Right. 
But yeah, I don't think we're ever going to get to the point where, you know, you can take your Fortnite gun into Minecraft or you go across games. And I, I would actually kind of argue, like, why do you even want to? As a consumer and as a consumer behavior, you enter a lot of these experiences understanding what you're going to get from the experiences. So Roblox, I think, might be probably the best example, or maybe even, you know, Fortnite with UEFN, is there are all these worlds that you can go and explore that are built off of that one kind of tech foundation and experience. In Roblox, you can go into the Barbie Dreamhouse world, or you can go into some world that some kid made and, you know, and it's a crappy experience and you can have that option. Again, that's like one execution. Like Correct. all those assets are never going to be interoperable with anything else. Like it wouldn't even make sense for Roblox to do that. Like he just completely lost me with that part. And then the third thing was that the decentralization thing, you know, so like the notion that they were going to have some ubiquitous world that was completely without centralized control, like there was no control over this ecosystem. That's just crazy talk, right? Like all these creators can have complete tabula rasa and can build whatever the fuck they want to build in this virtual world. Like that's never going to happen. There's always going to be centralized control on these type of ecosystems like Roblox or Fortnite or whatever, right? Step into the future of game monetization with Exola, the premier partner for game developers seeking to expand their reach and revenue. Exola provides a robust suite of tools designed to enhance user acquisition, managed subscriptions, and streamline payment solutions worldwide. Unlock new markets and maximize profitability through their customized, secure payment architecture and dedicated support team. Exola, powering game developers to achieve global success. This podcast is brought to you by Apps Flyer. In today's digital world, understanding your app's journey from discovery to download is more than just insightful, it's essential. Enter Apps Flyer, the leader in mobile attribution and marketing analytics that allows you to measure the full potential of your marketing efforts, making every ad dollar work smarter. With Apps Flyer, that's your new reality. Dive deep into data-driven insights that reveal exactly where your users come from and how they'll interact with your app. Apps Flyer, where your app's potential meets performance. So on the topic of Fortnite monetization, there's another piece of the interview, and I thought this was revealing from Tim. He says, there's no reason that this creator economy 2.0 couldn't be extended into a creator economy 3.0, where any company could participate however they choose. That is antithesis to what we had understood beforehand, that Fortnite was going to try to live off cosmetics as the monetization that funnels revenue to these individual islands, these creators, and having more flexibility in how creators choose to monetize their islands we've been talking about, super important part of getting the flywheel going. And I heard that their current revenue model, where they make attribution to different islands and they try to divide up the cosmetic revenue, was the share that was going to developers was decided very last minute by Tim before GDC. So I'm also sure like he can change his mind <laughs> on things. I think he's he's hmm. a man of reason as well, but I, I think there's a, there's a bashedness about him that's that's really admiring. So maybe maybe this is a turn of direction too, or, or maybe this he, he always thought about it evolving in this way. Now oh, Mishka's got a podcast out, actually came out this week with two guys. Brilliant cast. Yeah, highly, both highly had like experience at EA and now they have like six or 10 person UEFN dev teams that are making games and playing in the space. And I think, you know, both have had a little bit of success or, you know, are still trying to figure it out. But I think in, in the world of, hey, let's try some new things and like, let's try to explore, does that work? It was great to know how it kind of works from a team that's doing that. To take a step back to, well, listen, I... I'm a sci-fi nerd. I love this type of talk. And I think the challenge is that when people are out there trying to express new ideas and trying to be visionaries, they often don't have the idea. Like when I work with teams, I often, you know, I'm like, well, what about this or this? I'm like, please don't just take what I say because I am often never right. That's probably fun for me to say on a podcast. However, I spark other people to come up with the thing because they have the expertise and the discipline to do that. So I look at these type of things by Matthew Ball or Stevenson and say, okay, what is it that we can pull from it 
to spark the next best idea because they probably don't have it right. And uh, is that how you look at these types of things? Or do you think people took this too much as like gospel and I'm going to follow this line for line? I think a cottage oh industry formed around the term who used it to exploit it for natural resources called venture capital. That's, yeah. that's what I think <laughs> happens. Oh my God. I, I wish I had prepared this rant. I mean, like, <laughs> no, I think, I think he set the stage for something that was so absurd and that so much money was spent because the fourth thing that he actually said that makes no fucking sense was that the new economic frontier where digital currencies and blockchain technologies will play significant roles, enabling new forms of commerce and value exchange, right? So he was basically suggesting that blockchain was going to be the center of this economy, right? Like during the heyday of all these investments. So he was part of the zeitgeist of all these insane investments from venture capital and LPs that spent gajillions of dollars on complete fucking bullshit, right? So- no, I mean, I think he is somewhat responsible, like making these predictions, going out there on the road and like presenting at conferences and, and he has some sole responsibilities. And I think part of the reason that he's starting to use the word spatial internet is because he knows his definition of metaverse was ridiculous right? from the get-go, right? <laughs> he's rebranding. Now, yeah, he's, he's rebranding it, right? People need to think pragmatically about this stuff before, you know, all these big a16z and galaxy and fucking griffin all these guys are sh shelling out all their fucking all this money on nonsense you know speaking of trends speaking of trains trends there's an ai take in here from sweeney he says i think generative ai will lead to dramatic productivity gains because the ease of creation of objects that will meet your specific needs also like all other technological improvements this will increase opportunities for creators and employment industries opportunities in the industry as a whole love it love it tim like he gets it like this is the stock economist take like ai is going to make people more productive we know when people become more productive wages increase that's the long-run correlation we've seen forever this is one of the main determinant of wages is increases in productivity and if you lower the price of making content you get a lot more of it this is an awesome outcome i'm really excited about this we're going to get more content we're going to get more opportunities we're going to get more games and productivity is going to rise you don't hear these takes coming out a lot. And I actually so agree with that. I, I, I think the fundamental problem, and I, I did listen to the podcast with uh, the guys who were doing UEFN stuff, um, including the, you know, the founder of Halo or Bungie. I mean, but the biggest challenge that they have is that they don't have alternative monetization models within UEFN. It's like a pure cosmetic yeah. economy based upon engagement, right? That can't scale. Like the more I think about it, the more I talk to people about it, like that is an absurd assumption that you can scale cosmetic economies, even with AI and with AI building stuff, because it then becomes completely commoditized at the end of the day. So people, if they're going to basically build successful games on UEFN, they need to be the ability to do what you do in Roblox, which is create your own type of monetization method and that seems to be not part of the plan for uefn but, but hold on, which is hold, huge but, but hold on we just just missed what we talked about earlier he talks about creator economy 3.0 i know i don't think the creator economy 3.0 is going to include like gotcha loot boxes more aggressive forms and exploitive forms of monetization that we pay for evolve. progression but, but, but it's just yeah, about tools right. though right it's just about giving developers those tools they don't need to go out and say that developers can do that I don't think they'll be implemented. You think they won't even allow it? No, like I randomized don't think they monetization mechanics. Wow, that'd be an interesting way to paint Roblox into a PR corner. They haven't gotten enough flack, I would argue, for a lot of different things. Oh my god, Roblox is on the dude. This this PETA shit is going on in Roblox, right? These like, I mean, oh Roblox the complaints. Their own problems, yeah. I saw an article. I didn't get a chance to read the whole thing. That there were like tens of thousands of complaints for of children getting harassed by disgusting old men or something. Yeah. Oh. Anyway, that's a that side note. That's a whole, a whole yeah. other thing. All right. Were you ready to uh, close out on that one? Anything else? I just want to summarize this quickly because I do think Matthew Ball does a, an exceptional job of articulating the history of gaming and where it's come from and where we are. I think that's why the book was really good. I said that before, you know, one of the few books I've actually read in the last 10 years. So anyway, but the notion that with persistent roles with interoperability and decentralization using blockchain as a significant role was preposterous then, and it's even more preposterous now, right? So that was at the crux of what he thought that this new metaverse would be. 
And I just, I just, just think there's way too much competition for consumers' attention and building some kind of centralized metaverse ubiquitous is just obscene and absurd, right? It's just never going to happen. So I don't know what the new book's all about. I, I do know that he's like, you know, kind of redefining spatial internet versus metaverse, which, you know, fuck, I don't know what that even means, but I, <laughs> I, doubt, I doubt he's spending any time apologizing for his, his mistakes the first time. So I don't know why he would be, a, what, what's the point of the new book besides actually the last two years of history of how he was wrong. Let's read it. We can do a little book club. We can do a little DOF. Book yeah. Club. yeah. I'm sure AI is in it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm surprised AI is not on the title somewhere. Right. Yeah. Uh, he's not going to be as com contemporary with the VC community and, <laughs> and doing his like, you know, speech tour. Right. But anyway, the first book is definitely worth the read. If you wanted to like understand the history of the gaming space, so he's good at that. All right. So the next article we wanted to go into is one of my favorite newsletters that I get. If you just spell it, it's super juiced. But actually how you say his name is Yost Van Drunen. So he is an NYU professor. And if you don't get that newsletter, you should. And this topic is one that I can't wait to talk about, digital toys at play. So Phil, can you, can you take us through some of the key points? Yeah, just briefly, the article talks about the fact that digital spaces have become the new social playground. And the shift isn't merely about translating physical toys or media franchises into digital formats. Instead, it's about creating immersive, interactive experiences that allow fans to live within their favorite branded worlds. And he has two great examples, or excuse me, two great tables in the piece. One of them is a rank of consumer spending on licensed toy, media, and entertainment IP and gaming. And we get to see how much revenue each of these licensors brings in in terms of their revenue on licensing for toys, media, and entertainment, gaming IP, or entertainment IP and gaming. And number one is Hasbro. And their best performing IP is, of course, Monopoly Go. He is estimating these himself, but I was surprised to see that Monopoly Go, I mean, it's just so overwhelmingly successful that Hasbro is by far, in a way, the number one licensor. And Disney is actually number two. I mean, we're taking a, a dunk on Disney, but they're, they're number two here. 1.7 yeah, last week, last week we talked about Disney, but Disney core IP, and I specifically excluded Marvel and Spider-Man and Star Wars, which are the bulk of their gaming revenue comes from those. And, and that, listen, that, that makes total sense, right? It aligns with the core consumer. I think what we were talking about, I can't believe I forgot some, some in that whole analogy was they, they have a more difficult time with the more casual female driven younger audience. My point was that most of the core IP goes too young for it to be kind of uh, massively successful in games. There's also another table that talks about the top 15 toy and entertainment franchises based on gaming revenue. And of course, Monopoly is the number one driven almost entirely by Monopoly Go. Number two is Harry Potter. And I assume this was driven by... Legacy. Yeah, the, by, by the, the, the HD, HD SKU game. last year. HD SKU. Pokemon Although Harry Potter three, has, course. I think, two or three mobile games that aren't awful, but the big number was from the HD game. The thing that surprises me most about going through this list is how small the revenue is. Like a lot of these, these gaming franchises, when you sum them all up, is, are not generating a lot of revenue. Like the top of the market is Monopoly, and that's just because of Monopoly Go. Yeah, for sure. Harry Potter is driven, is seasonal by one HD game. Pokemon is all Pokemon Go. Dragon Ball is interesting. That's probably a 50-50 mix of the HD games, the HD fighting games, and some mobile games. D&D &D is probably one time. Boulder's Gate. Yep. Spider-Man is probably one time. One Piece, I'll be interested to see how One Piece generates mobile. revenue. Star Wars is Galaxy of Heroes. I'm just surprised. Like this, this list in terms of the revenue they generate per year, I mean, it, it declines rather rapidly. Like Snap is 12th, 12th. Oh, Marvel Snap. Yeah. Like, I mean, if, if that's even getting ranked. Well, they didn't add. So Contest of Champions is Marvel. Snap. Strike Force is Marvel. So there's yeah. three Marvel titles on there. If you group those all together. Yeah, they, sh they should be grouped, to be honest with you. No, got it. So the thing that I loved about the topic of this article is, is, you know, what I talk about all the time. It's the intersection of IP, toys, games, and social spaces and immersive experiences. So for the two of you who have never heard me talk on this podcast, I have half of my career within the toy industry at Hasbro and Mattel, where I did action figure marketing and 
made toys. And then I did toy licensing at Disney. The other half was obviously in making licensed and unlicensed games. So licensed games were Hasbro. I made hundred, not hundreds, tens of Monopoly games, WWE, Walking Dead, and then non-licensed games like League and TFT. And so I've seen all of this from all of the different perspectives. But in the way back machine, why I left the toy industry, and this goes back to what we're talking about earlier with Hasbro, is, you know, back in the early 2000s, around 2006, I was like, oh my God, I grew up loving games and kids were, were leaving toys much earlier in life than ever before. So I used to make action figures targeting like an eight to 10 year old boy. And even in the early 2000s, it was becoming like a four to five year old boy and just going down and down and down because that the idea of that plastic toy just wasn't as attractive as, you know, what you see in these, you know, mobile games. And, and what's funny is even back then, there was no such thing as a mobile game. I was only competing with, you know, like DS and Wii and, and 360. And now you've got, you know, it's a thousand times worse. 80% of kids watch YouTube, 94% of kids, and this is kids under 12, play games. Well over 60% of those kids, so almost every kid plays a game, 60% plus of those kids play on a mobile or a tablet. The, the interesting stat that I saw is only 25% of kids go to a movie theater anymore. So we used to think that movies drive an interest in content or IP and you know, that it's just not the case anymore. So why on earth would a kid want a little plastic thing and their imagination when they can get a dopa hit from a free game on a tablet? And that's what, you know, the toy industry is competing with these days. How do they get their new brands and their new IPs in front of a kid? And so, you know, Yoast kind of attempted to answer that with what Phil talked about earlier, which is about creating immersive, interactive experiences that allow fans to live within their favorite branded worlds. And having places where they can have self-expression, a shared experience with their friend and hang out. So let me talk about my silly marketing attempt to brand what I call the shelf to screen core loop. And what I think if you really still want to engage with a toy product and a video game product and grow your brand, this is what you have to do. So imagine you're creating an action figure or a doll or some new brand that has a plastic thing. And what you can do is put a visually distinct theme and like a mission on it. So it's not just Barbie, but it's, you know, Barbie who's going to space, or it's not just, you know, an action figure like a Star Wars guy or a Batman guy or any other character, but it's like they have a specific theme that makes them differentiated. So then, you know, imagine you go to the shelf and you get the toy and you open the toy, you scan a QR code and it takes you to this free app. And in that app, you get a checklist and you get videos and you get your mini games, all of which tell you how to take that toy and really deepen that experience with that play pattern. So you, in a sense, are using digital to tell the kid how to play. Isn't this the Nintendo thing? We have, we have the Disney Infinity. How isn't this Toys to Life stuff? Or isn't this thesis has already been played out a million different times? So it's not Toys to Life. So correct. And, and this isn't new. Correct. So what, what's different is you are using this to teach people and teach kids why they should care about the plastic object. You're telling me that's not the revenue generating center anymore. So I remember you were talking on an earlier cast. You said most of the people who buy toys are actually adults. The age has shifted. And I, you know, it'd be interesting to see whether or not the nominal amount of revenue that's being spent on digital toys is decreasing. But when you describe this article to me, everything is about the game, right? That's the digital experience. That's, the, that's the primary way that they interact with the IP or with the brand. So like, why would you want to drive people back to the thing that's making less and less revenue? Like the, the, you want the toys to go to the games, right? I mean, this is similar to what we were talking about with Hasbro. Yes. So this is why I call it the shelf to screen loop loop, because if you can drive people to the game and in the game, so imagine then you take this a step further and then you collaborate with Brawl Stars or Stumble Guys or Minecraft, or you have Game Fam make a Roblox experience of this, that becomes a marketing tool where kids learn about this IP. They learn about these missions. They want to play with the toy. They play with the toy. They get another toy. Then they go back to the game. And so it becomes this loop in a marketing tool where you've got, in, in a sense, if you partner with Brawl Stars, that's 50 million DAU in most cases that a game company actually can make some money off of. They can, uh, not the game company, but the IP holder can actually make a rev share if they put that into their 
their game and create this marketing loop. Everyone makes a little bit of money off of that. The kids get to deepen their IP with that. So the example that I use is, so Brawl Stars again. So back in April and May, they did a deal with Godzilla. So there was a Godzilla movie. So it was Transmedia, Phil, your favorite thing ever. So with that Brawl Stars event, which was actually very successful for Brawl Stars, I just saw JK did a whole like webisode going deep into the specific event. So if the game company can take the IP and that kind of mission and leverage it into something cool for the game, what also happens is that as the kids are playing with that event, they get interested in these characters, they go back to the shelf. So in May, the number one and two toy industry items sales for action figures were Godzilla. And so what's crazy is in the world of the toy industry, Godzilla has never been a top selling action figure item ever. And so is it coincidence? I don't have the exact one-to-one -one attribution data to prove this. However, you can say if 50 million DAU had a chance to experience Godzilla and then Godzilla toy sales in that month were the best ever, because it's never been driven by a movie in the past, is this idea of a shelf to screen loop actually coming true? And so this is, I'm gonna trademark it, but this is my new hypothesis of how you can be successful in creating this entire experience. It's not just plastic, it's not just game, but it's an immersive experience that takes you all the way through it. Am I crazy? Yes, I think you're, you're absolutely crazy. So here, here's the thing though, if this is true, and if you're, if you're thinking about Brawl Stars as a distribution channel for your IP, your Hasbro IP, your Godzilla IP, why won't you just pay Supercell? Why shouldn't Supercell just auction off that space? Or if you're an IP holder, pay them, because you're trying to get the upside on the toy revenue. No, 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 why, no. Why, why, why not? Why aren't people bidding this down? Like if this is a marketing play for you and Supercell's providing a benefit to you, you should lower your price. You shouldn't charge for that. I want more of that. Like I want to license my IP to everyone. It's a marketing benefit for them as well. They had success sure. by taking the IP and creating an experience. It is a win-win. So the, my point is that it's a win-win because the game, the game company gets an IP they get to do something really cool and fun for their consumers in it. It draws them in. It's a UA acquisition tool that lowers the cost of CPIs because they can go and market, you know, the fact that this now the game company has to make something cool out of it. You can't label slap. I mean, that's why we are seeing all of these collaborations happen in all, inside of all of these games is that fans and players are really enjoying this. What we're also seeing is that it can benefit people outside of the game experience, the IP holder who can take that. And by the way, if you create this like mission and this theme, you can go and put it on t-shirts. You can go and put it on other CPG products. CPG is cons consumer packaged goods. So imagine you can get bedding, you can get stationery, you can get, you know, you know, shoes for the kid to engage in this. So what it does is it allows IP holders and all of their licensees to rise in the, in the amount of marketing awareness and the sales that they get by doing that. And everyone benefits. I'm just You're gonna leave dubious. the transmedia thesis alone. I'm just gonna leave it alone for this episode. It's not necessarily transmedia in the sense that it is how you market your IP in, in today's new world by leveraging these immersive experiences, by tapping into places that attract more people than doing a TV commercial on Cartoon Network. And, and that makes sense to me. The only, the only thing I'm really trying to argue for here is I think there's a large contracting space in between the fee that is paid to the licensor having the IP distributed within this particular game. I'm not quite sure that the economic power is in the IP holder's hand. I actually think the people who own these distribution channels like Fortnite and Brawl Stars that have these 50 million DAU that are going to these platforms, you can call them platforms every single day, I think they have a lot of economic power and that economic power should be displayed in how these agreements are made. And I think they should get a higher share of revenue or they should get the IP for free because it's they basically do. just featuring for them. So you don't think they paid Godzilla any amount of money for this? They did. I mean, I, I certainly know this by having done this in the past is that there is a rev share agreement because you can't just put any IP into your game and not expect to pay for that IP. But we were just talking about a Tesla Cybertruck, right? Like this is a great example. The Tesla Cybertruck is now going to be in Fortnite. I have a hard time imagining that Epic Games paid Elon Musk some amount of money absolutely. for that. I think that's they a marketing deal. paid. For, you think nope. they paid for that? I think Elon did it for yes. free. I don't think they paid a nickel for... The fucking Cybertruck. Yeah, I, I, I don't think so either. Emotional vehicle. I think it goes the other way.
<laughs> well, they absolutely pay. They absolutely pay something. In fact, it's, you know, for Fortnite, I imagine it would be, you know, you, you can do flat fee. And because they work with everyone, they could say, we pay X. No matter who you are, we pay X so that they don't have to go and negotiate every single license. Fortnite can probably command that and say, you're going to get X. Other games give percentages of IAP. Some of them now include percentages of ad revenue plus IAP, like Stumble Guys, right? Stumble Guys, they have to figure out some sort of engagement model because it's mostly an ad-driven game. Brawl Stars is probably a percentage of IP. They're differentiated models, but there is no way that an IP holder would put something inside of a game and pay for that experience today because that's not how licensing works. I mean, this is exactly what they do on Roblox. I don't think that's true at all. Like, this is exactly the Barbie Dreamhouse example he goes through. Like, that, that is paying. They are paying to have branded experiences on Roblox, right? That, so that is different. That's going the other way. They're providing a benefit to Roblox. They're paying for Roblox engagement to go up. Roblox won that deal. Yeah, I don't know how Roblox has done that because what happens is you have to pay somebody to create the experience. So the money isn't going to Roblox for just a licensing deal. The money is going to a company to build an experience to put inside of Roblox. I'm just saying Roblox gets Barbie, Roblox gets Gucci, Roblox get all these brands and they don't pay a single dime and they they properly exploit the power of their platform it's because they want to get to these kids, vans, all these grand, you hear about them every other week. They want to get to this, this great. They built the engine. This is how the all engine right, should, so we'll should fire. So we'll save that topic for next week. All right. All right. <laughs> See you next week, everyone. Later, guys. You did it. You made it to the end of the episode. As a fan of the show, it would help us out if you subscribe and leave us a review on the podcast service of your choice. More importantly, are you a member of the Deconstructor of Fun Slack group? If you have five years or more of games industry experience, go to deconstructorofun.com slash slack and apply to join. Join the games industry's best professional community filled with peers always willing to lend a hand. Or subscribe to our newsletter to get all the latest insights from the Deconstructor of Fun content creators. Thanks for listening.